COVID cases in England up 80% since Christmas. Is it now only a matter of time before lockdown rules get tougher? With a warning, the NHS faces the most dangerous moment in its history. The number of deaths have risen by 30% in just a week. This is a, a, a very perilous moment. Now is the moment uh, for maximum vigilance, maximum uh, observation, observance of the, of the rules. But tonight is the PM who's facing questions. As it emerges, he went on a bike ride yesterday, seven miles from Downing Street. Robert has the details, also on News at 10. Policing the lockdown, Dan joins West Midlands officers as they crack down on the lawbreakers. Why are some unwilling to learn? This is why the virus is spreading, is because people like you are not sticking to the rules. Chased down after murdering three men in Reading, the terrorist given a whole life sentence. We filmed her celebrating in Florida on election night, so what does this huge Trump fan make of his prospects now, and? 23, 24, he run his print. Hollywood comes knocking for the young star of Vera to play one of the biggest figures in civil rights history. You know, we were on the phone for, for weeks before she cast me, and it was a really, I sort of took the opportunity to really try and convince her that I was excited. This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Etchingham. Good evening. The effect of the Christmas Day easing of virus restrictions may not have kicked in yet, but already hospital admissions have gone up 80% since then in England at least. That is one more startling figure in a stream of them over the past week that have numbed many of our normal responses and put unsustainable pressure on our medical staff and resources. One hospital is running short of oxygen. England's Chief Medical Officer Chris Whitty said parts of the NHS are facing the most dangerous situation in living memory. The Prime Minister called it a perilous moment and the moment to stick to the rules. But do those rules allow going on a bike ride seven miles from home for exercise? Mr Johnson was apparently spotted doing just that yesterday afternoon. And his health secretary, Matt Hancock, had another message for rule breakers. Don't say you are exercising when really you're just socialising. We have seen critically ill coronavirus patients being treated in intensive care before, but we should never get used to it. Six patients are waiting to be admitted to this ward at St Helier Hospital in Surrey. Nearly half its beds are taken up with people suffering from COVID. It's a crisis never seen before. They're saying we're going to see what faces before it gets better, and we are already struggling with what we're seeing now been in nursing for 20 years and intensive care for 17 years. I've never seen this, honestly. I feel like sometimes I'm in a war, in a war zone. As Hidja worked, the chief medical officer said the NHS is in the most dangerous situation in living history. The numbers in hospital in England are now far greater than in either March or November's peak. Today they hit a new record of over 32,000. That's up 20% on a week ago and a staggering rise of 81% since Christmas Day. The truth is things will get worse before they get better. Visiting Bristol's mass vaccine centre, the Prime Minister warned us the jab won't have an effect for many weeks. Until then, tough restrictions are the only solution. We cannot be complacent and the, the worst thing now would be for us to um, allow success in rolling out a vaccine programme to, to breed any kind of complacency about the state of the pandemic. This is a, a, a very perilous moment. We're going to keep the rules under constant review. Well, we have to tighten them and we will. Tonight, Morrisons and Sainsbury's confirmed they will enforce mask wearing in their shops and police are cracking down on people meeting in parks. But rules on who we can meet and where we can go have led to confusion. Boris Johnson himself was spotted cycling seven miles from Downing Street, 
not necessarily a breach, insisted his health secretary. It is OK to go if you went for a long walk and ended up seven miles away from uh, home. That is OK, but you should stay local. Please get out there and have uh, take exercise because it's good for you. It's good for your physical and mental health. But don't say that you're exercising when really you're just socialising. It's a warning Georgina wants everyone to heed. Her elderly mother, Sue, died of coronavirus in December. There is nothing romantic about how this happens. This is the most cruel and awful thing. And yet people are still insisting on going to garden centres or, you know, shops that are not really essential. South End Hospital in Essex begins to ration oxygen because it's running low. It is perhaps a message everyone should be thinking about. Emily Morgan, News at 10. Well, while the government decides whether to toughen up restrictions, the existing ones are proving difficult for the police to enforce. Some senior officers say it's because the rules aren't as clear as they could be. It is also because there are so many potential breaches to investigate. For example, since the start of September, the West Midlands force has had more than 26,000 COVID call-outs involving 85,000 people and handing out nearly 1,400 fines. In the last week alone, West Midlands officers have investigated nearly 2,000 incidents of lockdown rule-breaking. We were filming with them this weekend. Can you open the door, please, the police. Most of us are sticking to the rules, but the police are finding a stubborn minority who won't. We're with West Midlands police who've been called to a pub in Walsall after reports of people drinking inside. Open up, speak to us, I'm going to force entry. Last chance. The occupants are refusing to open the front or back door, so officers get ready to do it the hard way. A lockdown lock-in is about to be rudely interrupted. Inside signs of a boozy night, men who seem angry their game of pool has been interrupted. Inside um, the bar, there's a the table with eight chairs around it. There's a selection of alcohol and some fast food. But in a rear bedroom, you've got four people uh, pretending to be asleep um, and one male on the roof. They do not reside at this, this location. Um, they have all been issued with £200 fixed penalty notices. Can I give you a ticket? That's fine, that works with me. But the minute you start being like you'll be able to get locked up in the not police not regularly get threatened by people refusing to wear a mask, refusing to stick to the rules. One of the drinkers wants to talk and seems utterly unrepentant. You can't go to any shops, but yet you can go to any supermarket and bump into 200 people. Yeah, but you're supposed to be wearing a mask and you're supposed to be no. minimizing your contact with other people. I always wear a mask. Were you wearing a mask in there? No. No? And this is why the virus is spreading, is because people like you are not sticking to the rules. West Midlands police have responded to more than 26,000 alleged COVID breaches since September. This one is typical. Cafe where staff and some customers aren't wearing masks. Even with the police there, the man behind the counter refuses to put a mask on. He's fined a thousand pounds. His customers have been told to leave repeatedly. On the other side of the city, the team are checking reports of a party. Neighbours have seen guests entering this house with alcohol. Hey, could somebody just run that vehicle through? When officers check the cars outside, they realise two of the guests have travelled 20 miles from Coventry. It's a clear breach. This may seem pretty harsh, each of them getting a £200 fine for having an evening, a party uh, together. But the rules are absolutely clear and right now it is critical that people stop the virus spreading.
The night we filmed with them, there were 57 incidents, resulting in 17 penalties. If we want to understand why COVID remains stubbornly high, we need to look not just at the government response, but also our own behaviour. Dan Rivers, News at 10, Birmingham. And Robert joins us now. First of all, Robert, uh, just touch briefly on this bike ride and the Prime Minister, the, the, the journey he took yesterday. And, but a focus, please, on how quickly we might see some more restrictions coming, given they seem pretty inevitable now. So let's just start with what's happening in terms of the infection. And to an extent, we just have to screen out the absolutely terrible news about admissions to hospitals and deaths, which... Emily was talking about because they reflect infections that happened two, three weeks ago. There is some evidence that infections are falling just a little bit, especially in the hot spot of London. But it's very hard to know whether the trend is downward enough because we had that tremendous surge over Christmas when people frankly, just were not social distancing enough. So when I talk to the government's scientific advisers, they say it is still a bit too early to judge whether the very significant restrictions that are on us at the moment are enough to bring the rate of infection down to protect our NHS. And so, you know, what the government is considering, not immediately, but possibly sometime this week, are further restrictions such as telling us, for example, we can't any longer take exercise with somebody from another household. Now, on that issue of obeying the rules, we heard the Prime Minister today saying it's no time to be complacent. Some people have raised eyebrows about that bike ride that he took around the Olympic Park, which is seven miles away from Downing Street. Now, by no stretch of the imagination is the Olympic Park local to Downing Street. So what I think many people want to know is, was he really following the rules. Robert, thank you. The race to protect as many people as possible from the virus stepped up a gear today with the opening in England of seven mass vaccination centres and it needs to be stepped up. So far, 2.6 million vaccinations have been given to a total of 2.3 million people because some are second doses. Ministers and officials are suggesting it's a shortage of the vaccines that is holding things back but are confident that they'll hit their targets. They donned their masks, they came early and they queued in the cold, even though most of the people getting vaccinated today were over 80. It is the biggest vaccination programme in British history. It's really exciting. This is the NHS at its best. We're all pulling together to get this country out of this horrible COVID-19 situation. It's really quite emotional. Seven new mass vaccination centres opened for business today. They are only open to people who have letters giving them an appointment time. Although here in Stevenage they have found that people are so keen to have the vaccinations. They're turning up early. There's a big queue outside the front door. But it's worth it. In two weeks' time, these people will start to have the kind of immunity that will start to change their lives. I think it's wonderful. I'm glad I'm here. Afterwards, I will be able to go out. And so because I have been cooped up at home for God knows how long. By the middle of February, the government wants the 15 million people most at risk to have received their first dose. That includes the over 70s, healthcare workers and shielders. The remaining 17 million in priority groups, including everyone over 50, should be vaccinated by the spring. That means delivering around 2 million vaccinations a week, more than double last week's 990,000. It's another difficult target for the health secretary to hit. So can he do it? Yes. We're on track to meet that target. It's an ambitious, stretching but achievable target and I'm confident that we're going to do it. There will be bumps along the road. Shirley Smith was told to get her vaccination not in Bristol near her home but in centres far away. Solly Hall was going to be 70.4 miles or Epsom was going to be 97 miles. If I went on my scooter... I think it does about four miles to a battery charge, which would be absolutely ridiculous. Battery charging aside, the programme seems to be starting well. The big challenge now is to ramp up to and maintain a much higher level of delivery. Carl Dinan, News at 10. 
When Celtics footballers set off for a training camp in Dubai, they weren't actually breaking any COVID rules, but it raised plenty of eyebrows. Now they have paid the price. They had to play their Scottish Premiership match against Hibernian tonight without most of their first team. 16 players and staff are isolating. Celtic is far from the only British club to have problems with irresponsible behaviour. Three Spurs players and one West Ham player broke coronavirus rules over Christmas by meeting friends and family for a party. Some fans of non-league Marine appeared to get too close to one another outside their ground before yesterday's FA Cup match. And Spurs have had their opponents switch for their game on Wednesday night because of an outbreak at Aston Villa, where 10 players have tested positive. As Celtic joins the list, Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon said she was disappointed and frustrated that her daily coronavirus briefing was again being dominated by football. This is Celtic, but not as we know them. In the middle of a global pandemic, the Scottish champions went to Dubai for a warm weather training camp, but came back to a frosty reception and a positive COVID case. 16 are now isolating, including the team manager and his assistant. Tonight, they were forced to play youths and had an inexperienced deputy leading in the dugout. A phone call late yesterday. Um, obviously, it happened quite quick. Um, so we found out what, what players we had available. You know, shuffle them into a team shape. No time to work on it, obviously. Um, but yeah, it was as quick as that and just trying to make the most of a bad situation. Celtic were given permission to go to Dubai back in November on the basis of it being an essential elite sports training camp. But then pictures like this emerged. Manager Neil Lennon apparently having a poolside pint with the club captain. Scotland's First Minister is furious and called on the Scottish FA to investigate. Well, I do have doubts based on how the club itself described it. Uh, doubts about whether Celtic's trip to Dubai was really essential. And I have doubts based on some pictures I've seen about whether adherence to bubble rules was strict enough. Celtic still insist going to Dubai was an essential training camp. But this is the player who tested positive returning from Dubai. Christopher Julien is in crutches because he has a long-term injury and can't train. Celtic say they've followed all protocols and could just as easily have caught coronavirus staying in Scotland. But while football is allowed to continue here tonight, the lower leagues of Scotland were told today that their league has been suspended for the next three weeks. But scientists are now questioning how elite football can safely continue. I think people are questioning the viability of elite sport and, and football uh, continuing in the current circumstances. So I think it's looking at the guidance and asking, are all of these exceptions needed, particularly the travel issue at the current time? Uh, because footballers need to, um, you know, they need to lead by example, they need to be an example. They're very, very privileged and they're very influential. Back on the pitch, Celtic's rookies could only draw trying to stay in the title race. But there are no more guarantees that Scottish football will still have a title race to play for. Peter Smith, News at 10, Glasgow. Now, it's in those hopeful days of summer when virus cases were way down and restrictions were lifting that three men enjoying an af afternoon in the sun were stabbed to death in a park in Reading. Kari Sadala was a Libyan failed asylum seeker with terrorist connections and a string of crimes to his name. He had only come out of prison two weeks before the attack. Today, he was given a whole life sentence. The father of one of his victims said he should not have been free to kill, but deported instead. Good to see you too, yeah. It's been a little while, hasn't it? Yeah, man, I'm off to trouble now. It is June of last year, and police officers are checking on a young Libyan-born man recently released from prison. Kari Sadala tells them he is reformed. What they didn't know was that same day he'd bought an eight-inch knife from a Morrison's supermarket. And just one day later, he would use it to murder friends James Furlong, David Wales and Joseph Ritchie Bennett. Strangers to the killer, their lives taken at random. Today, as Sadala learned, he'll spend his life in prison for bringing to Britain the violence and terror he claimed he'd come here to escape. The families of his victims talked of their loss. For us as a family, it's been devastating to lose our much-loved son, brother and uncle. We know that our lives and the lives of everyone who knew and loved David will never be the same. We love you, David. May you, James and Joe, now rest in peace. 
Sadala is seen here running away from Reading's Forbury Park after killing the three men and wounding three others. He'd planned to cut himself and pretend to be another victim, but that strategy ended when police officers caught up with him a short distance from the scene. Passing sentence today, Justice Sweeney said Sadala had used combat skills he'd learnt in a previous life in Libya to deadly effect in this Reading Park. His attack was so ruthless, swift and brutal, the first three men he encountered had no chance to defend themselves. He is a committed jihadist, and as we heard in court, he planned his attack in meticulous detail. He begins concurrent whole life sentences, having already inflicted the same on the loved ones of his victims. Paul Davis, News at 10, Reading. To other news now, no American president has ever been impeached twice, but then there's never been a president quite like Donald Trump. The process has begun. He has been formally charged with incitement of insurrection over the storming of the Capitol last week. Democrats say that if Mr Trump is not forced out of office by his own vice president and officials, they will consider the impeachment on Wednesday, a week after the siege and a week before he leaves office. Well, Robert joins us now from Washington. So just nine days to go until Trump is officially out of office, out of the White House. What realistically uh, do the Democrats hope they can achieve by then? Well, as you say, Julia, stunningly ambitious agenda. Tomorrow, the House of Representatives here is going to vote uh, to demand that Mike Pence, the vice president, invokes the 25th Amendment uh, to remove Donald Trump. We know that the vice president has uh, zero appetite for that, so we can, we can fully expect that to fail. So on Wednesday, the House members would then uh, vote on that article of impeachment, a single article to keep it simple, uh, incitement, of insurrection. We know that Joe Biden is somewhat ambivalent about impeachment, fearing it takes the oxygen out of the room, overshadows his first 100 days. He has suggested the Senate divides its day, in fact, does his business in the morning confirming his nominees, and then in the afternoon holds the trial of Donald J. Trump with senators acting as jurors. There is, of course, here also uh, this lingering fear about political violence. Uh, uh, the president-elect was asked whether he's concerned for his own safety by implication of assassination on January the 20th. He said he would continue to take his oath of office outside on the platform here uh, overlooking the National Mall, just like his predecessors. Robert, thank you very much uh, indeed for that. Quite a few days to come. And tomorrow night on ITV, Robert will reveal in a special programme just what it was like inside the Congress building when it was besieged by Trump supporters. His eyewitness account storming the Capitol. The inside story is on ITV tomorrow night right after the news. And when President Trump leaves the White House, having lost November's election, at least... He will always have Florida. It's where his Mar-a-Lago mansion is, of course, and Florida stuck firmly with him in the election when other close-run states didn't. But has the Sunshine State's support for Mr Trump been clouded by the events of last week? We've been back to the place he calls home. It is the crown jewel of Donald Trump's property empire. This 20-acre estate on the billionaire's paradise island, Palm Beach, stretches from shore to shore. Hence the name, Sea to Lake, or in Spanish, Mar a Lago. Now it's poised to be known as something else as well, the capital of Trump world. If, as expected, he bases himself here, he'll be among America's richest political donors as he plans his future. As well as the luxury, this place has other advantages, including a legal loophole that's unique to Florida residents. It's called Homestead Creditor Protection, and it prevents banks from seizing the homes of people who don't pay back loans. There are reports that the Trump Organization is in debt to the tune of $400 million, much of it personally guaranteed by the president himself. Where we're standing now is five uh, miles north of Mar-a-Lago. This newly built seven-bedroom beachside home has just come on the market. It's yours for $75 million. Rosalind Clark, originally from Tunbridge Wells, moved to Florida 40 years ago. 
Like all Palm Beach estate agents, she's familiar with Mr. Trump's history on the island. He's had a few run-ins with the, with the powers that be. Yes, he has. When he first came here, he wasn't very popular because he wanted to fly this enormous flag, which did not comply to the rules of Palm Beach town. And they're quite fussy about that. So, um, of course, he has um, a, an ability to get these things through and he managed to uh, keep his flag. And now you'll see it flying above Mar-a-Lago. Della Stryker will be one of those welcoming Mr. Trump to Palm Beach. On the night of the presidential election, she danced for joy when he won Florida, the state that will soon be his home, and she believes the springboard for his comeback. That. I think that 80 million people that voted for him really have studied a lot and know more, and they really, um, they, they stand with him, and uh, they're standing behind him. This island may prove to be an ideal hideaway for America's latest former president, a luxurious and private sanctuary for the licking of wounds and for plotting before perhaps lowering the drawbridge and entering the fray once more. John Irvine, News at 10, Palm Beach in Florida. Which brings us neatly to Miami in Florida. Anyone would think that we planned it, or at least to the film One Night in Miami. It's a drama about a real-life meeting between four icons of African-American history, including the boxer Muhammad Ali and the civil rights campaigner Malcolm X. It's directed by Oscar-winning actor Regina King in her debut on the other side of the camera. One of its stars is Kingsley ben -Adir, familiar to ITV viewers from the detective drama Vera. The entire city of Miami is celebrating. I'm the new heavyweight champion of the world, and I don't even have a scratch on my face. Oh, my goodness. Cash. Sean Cash? Why am I so pretty? <laughs> It is 1964, the height of the civil rights movement, and Cassius Clay, soon to be Muhammad Ali, on converting to Islam, has just become the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. When, when is this party going down? Yeah, that's a good question. What's on the agenda, Malcolm? Well, I thought this would be a wonderful chance for us to reflect on what's happened tonight. Like One Night in Miami is inspired by his real-life encounter with civil rights activist Malcolm X, American football star Jim Brown, and soul singer Sam Cooke. Adapted from a stage play by Kent Powers, the conversation is about race and inequality in America. And for Oscar-winning actress Regina King, directing her first feature film, it was exactly the project she'd been looking for. As an audience, I've never seen four men realize this, four black men realize this way. Sometimes you may get one, but four together in the same room. I wanted to be able to tell a story that the men in my life that I know and love, my son, my uncle, if my father was still here, um, would recognize themselves in, in that piece. You were filming in January of last year, then COVID happened to the world, but you were determined to get the film released now. We did not have a crystal ball. We had no idea that we'd be in this powder keg moment that we're in right now. The world outside of just black America seemed to be um, watching and paying attention. Uh, we felt uh, it was um, more urgent. And what a moment for British actor Kingsley ben -Adir chosen to play Malcolm X. 23, 24, you run his print. Known to TV viewers here from the detective series Vera, he fought for the role. My audition process was with Regina. You know, we were on the phone for, for weeks before she cast me, and it was a really, I sort of took the opportunity to really try and convince her that I was excited and I was like up for the challenge. We are fighting for our lives. The film is being tipped for success at the Oscars. With that ceremony now pushed back, many will be watching to see if on issues of diversity, Hollywood has indeed moved forward. Nina Nanar, News at 10. 
And that is just about it from us for tonight. A reminder, after all that discussion about sticking to the lockdown rules, there is a list on our website of what you can and cannot do in England. But from all of us for now, from here and at home, good night. We'll see you tomorrow.